Turkey at this time is reminding Guyana that a piece of Guyana belongs to Suriname. That is what is happening right now. It is not true. Everybody wants a piece of Guyana. You guys know that reggae song, the guy Golly Bob just passed away. Everybody wants a walk out for, you know. Everybody wants a walk out for Guyana now. On the western side, Maduro wants a walk out for Guyana. Maduro wants a piece of Guyana, unjustly. That part of Guyana doesn't belong to a Maduro or a Venezuela. And then you go down further to the east now, Santoki and Suriname want a piece of Guyana. We've engaged CARICOM, the OS, the Commonwealth, and many of our bilateral partners, including the United States of America, Brazil, the United Kingdom, and France. Yes. The demonstrators are shown with the flag of Venezuela, banners in defense of this upheaval, and the new map of the nation implemented in schools. The government of Venezuela seeks to incorporate the organic law to create the state of Guayana Esequiba and the election of authorities in the region. President Maduro and Executive Vice President participated in the event. During his speech, the Venezuelan head of state took the opportunity to demand once again the coercive measures against the Venezuelan people be lifted. In the meantime, I'll keep fighting him off. On my first day back in the White House, I will terminate every open borders policy of the Biden administration and begin the largest deportation operation in American history. No country can sustain what they're putting us through. Knows that, right? India used to be called long, long, long time ago, Eastern Ethiopia. Everybody knows that, right? No. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> you also probably heard there is a big river in India called Ganges. Okay. To be frank, till two years back, I did not know what the meaning of the word Ganges. I simply know Ganges is Ganges. Do you know the name Ganges is one of the strongest and famous emperors of Ethiopia? That's right. Do you think uh, some crazy Aryans would name a big river in India after an Af African uh, emperor? Would not. Simple logic says that. Marafi Sai, welcome back to the channel. Now, so many things are going on in Guyana right now. Man, there's so many, so many, so many topics for us to talk about. Now, we have Maduro taking his steps on invasion to the point where he now has this map that he's unfolding to the world, showing Esquibo as a part of Venezuela. Now, you guys are going to let's have a conversation about that. Because what do you think about that? He's very bold, isn't he? Do you think his steps are real steps? Do you think that he could have made those steps if Donald Trump was in power still? And what do you think the U.S. is going to do as far as its support for Guyana? Then we have Mark Benchcock sharing some very powerful insights into the situation that's going on right now in the country. We have the president, President Ali, sharing his sentiments and the information on the steps that the government is going to take in the border dispute with Venezuela. These topics and more. Let's dive right into the conversation. Marafisai, welcome back to the channel. Now, so many things are going on in Guyana right now. Man, there's so many, so many, so many topics for us to talk about. Now we have Maduro taking his steps on invasion to the point where he now has this map that he's unfolding to the world showing Esquibo as a part of Venezuela. Now you guys are going to let's have a conversation about that because what do you think about that? He's very bold, isn't he? Do you think his steps are real steps? Do you think that he could have made those steps if Donald Trump was in power still? And what do you think the U.S. is going to do as far as its support for Guyana? 
that we have Mark Benchkop sharing some very powerful insights into the situation that's going on right now in the country. We have the president, President Ali, sharing his sentiments and the information on the steps that the government is going to take in the border dispute with Venezuela. These topics and more. Let's dive right into the conversation. Madafisai, welcome back to the channel. Now, Toki, even though, yes, he's having problems within his own administration, uh, but Santoki knows that the PPP guys, Jack Dew and all those guys, are corrupt. He wants absolutely nothing to do with them. And so, Santoki... So as if we don't have enough problems already, whelming all over the place, and the tensions are not thick enough in the country. Now, you got Suriname looking to dispute another part of the country. How opportunistic of them. Like, right now is the perfect time, right? For them to try to kick you when you're down. For them to attack you when you're vulnerable. For them to try to get a piece know that it looked like venezuela can get a big piece of LA. make sure i give me peace now you see how people is always just there on you and it's just plotting and just waiting on the perfect opportunity to punch on the things they envy you for eh watch out Suriname, president slack pokey acting up like if he don't know that that does not belong to his territorial constituency he suddenly knew that hey this part of Guyana used to be Suriname and we can take it now whilst Venezuela is disputing the same time so they spread thin because they gotta deal with Venezuela so they can't really deal with we you see how people have moved but look we got a plan for them and we got a plan for all others that think that they can let's talk about this in the comment section guys what do you think about this new advance by the president of Suriname talking about he own thing and he want back the part of Suriname that Guyana now holds and all kind of folly and he even got the audacity to take the matter to the court could you imagine can you imagine and our head of states right now are saying that they're still having good conversations with, with, um, with these people and the conversations are favorable. Say if you and a person are having favorable conversations on a matter, how suddenly they file in a court case against you and your comments are still the same. You know, it makes one wonder what's really going on. But I'm pretty sure we're going to find out soon. Stay tuned and let's have a conversation about this in the comment section, man. Let's really start to sensitize ourselves on these matters. Also, Ghana will tomorrow bring this matter to the United Nations Security Council for appropriate action to be taken by that body. Further, we've engaged CARICOM, the OS, the Commonwealth, and many of our bilateral partners, including the United States of America, Brazil, the United Kingdom, and France. The Ghana Defense Force is on full alert and has engaged its military counterparts, including the U.S. Southern Command. By defying the court, Venezuela has rejected international law, the rule of law generally, fundamental justice and morality, and the preservation of international peace and security. They have literally declared themselves an outlaw nation. Nothing they do, however, will stop Guyana from proceeding with a case in the ICJ or stop the ICJ from ultimately issuing its final judgment on the merits of the case. We will not allow our territory to be violated nor the development of our country to be stymied by this desperate threat. In addition to this statement, I wish to respond to two questions. One from Starbuck News. Which states, and I will read the question, 
Will the Guyana government report President Maduro's announcement this evening to the United Nations Security Council and International Court of Justice in light of the latter's order that there be no aggravation of the circumstances? In relation to this question, absolutely. Guyana will be reporting this matter. We have already spoken to the UNSG and early in the morning, we will be officially writing the UN Security Council. We will be, inform we'll be, we will be informing the court of this development. And as I said, in the next 24 hours, we'll be informing all our bilateral partners and different agencies including CARICOM and Commonwealth and the West on this recent development. Let me be very clear that President Maduro's action is an open defiance of the ICJ order. In my opinion, he's testing the metal of the ICJ. He has taken a lonely and worrisome road of neglecting his responsibility as a member of the UN family, an adventurous and reckless part that can only bring instability to this region and can only create more uncertain circumstances for the Venezuelan people. We urge President Maduro to rethink these missteps and to act and behave in accordance with international law. All our actions and everything we do from Guyana is aimed at ensuring this region remains a region of peace. We want nothing. Our only ambition is for this region to remain a region of peace, a zone of peace, and for the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Guyana to be respected. We ask for nothing more or nothing less. So yes, this matter will be reported. We've already engaged. And the second question is from the Guyana Times. What is government's message to investors in light of Venezuela's position? Our message is very clear. Your investment is in a safe, democratic, stable country in which the rule of law prevails. You have nothing to worry about when you invest in a country that governs itself in accordance with the rule of law, that stands on the side of democracy, and that understands what true freedom is. So there is nothing to fear. Our international partners and international community are ready to support us. They have assured us of their support. And all we want is for these missteps to be corrected by President Maduro. And for Venezuela and the government of Venezuela to commit itself to peace and to act in a manner that is befitting of a member of the United Nations family. To my fellow Guyanese, we are here to ensure the safety of this country, the territorial integrity of this country, the sovereignty of this country and to protect every citizen. Tonight, I wanted to bring every guy in together to advise you on the steps your government is taking in relation to this latest, in relation to the latest action by Venezuela and these grave missteps by President Maduro. I thank you and God bless you. Now the President has given a very firm and stern presentation. And I must say that I accept and I respect the way that he puts across the message that he's addressing everyone, letting everyone know, like, yo, we need assistance here because Venezuela is getting out of hand. So I'm going to call in the UN. We're calling in all our allies. We're calling in CARICOM. Hey, CARICOM, 
the biggest oil producer in your region is being attacked by outside forces. AUN, your biggest oil producer in your union is being attacked by outside forces. Right after, we would have made the largest oil discovery in the world and had the largest growing economy still do right now in the world we are being attacked by persons who can't seem to hold their economy together by persons who can't seem to keep their citizens from fleeing to every rich part of the world that you look to the u.s to canada all the way to different parts that i might not even mention right now and don't let's forget that they're filling up different parts of the same country guyana that their president is now claiming that he will have complete control over 70 percent of it by january 25th how crazy is that much respect to the president and he's doing a great job and everyone should be rendering their support to whatever is needed to hold one unified front, one Guyana. The slogan that was brought by the young president is one that we all should be focused on right now, regardless of who you are, because let me, let me, let me drop a little bit of history because some persons are divided and there's no division here. The division is one that's caused by ignorance because persons are divided over oh, black people this, Indian people this, um, this race, the that race this. But ultimately, Indians are Africans. And technically, if they're claiming that melanated beings that are indigenous to Guyana and that are native to Guyana, some might have came from that diaspora in what is the alleged so-called slave trade, then it means that Africans and who we are calling Indians, they both share a similar ancestry because they're all Africans. So we're all Africans dealing with forces coming in, invading our territory, and we should stand unified because we have common ancestry and don't find ourselves divided over things that are ignorant, things that are foolish. Because if you trace it all back, technically, and I'll put the snippet in the end of the video so that you guys could get a little bit more information on what I'm talking about. India is Ethiopia. So technically the president is from Ethiopia, right? So let's move on a unified front because guess what? Venezuela ain't playing around and they moving on a unified front. Here's just some of what we'll do when we become we, we, all of us together, because we, this is a we effort. We become the 47th president of the United States of America. I will totally obliterate the deep state, stop the weaponization of our government, and overhaul the corrupt FBI and the very corrupt DOJ from the ground up. In the meantime, I'll keep fighting him off. On my first day back in the White House, I will terminate every open borders policy of the Biden administration and begin the largest deportation operation in American history. No country can sustain what they're putting us through. And we'll start with the bad ones. And you know who knows the bad ones? Our police forces, our local police forces. They know them all and they know them by name. I will also use Title 42 to end the child trafficking crisis by returning all trafficked children to their families in their home countries, and we'll do that immediately. It's a terrible situation. On day one, I will sign a new executive order to cut federal funding for any school pushing critical race theory, transgender insanity, and any other inappropriate racial, sexual, or political content on our children. I will not give one penny to any school that has a vaccine mandate or a mask mandate. And as I said, 
A little while ago, I will keep men out of women's sports. We will do that. Doesn't that sound like a very easy one? <laughs> I can't even believe they give me thunderous applause. I will keep men out of women. And I say, can you believe I'm even saying this? It's almost easy to be a politician now. You have things that are just so ridiculous, right? Just as I did for four years, I will fully uphold the Second Amendment. We will restore free speech, and I will secure our elections, totally secure. Our goal will be one day voting with paper ballots and voter ID, right? One day voting, not 48 days, not 62 days. They have thousands of ballots lying all over the floors. Get me some more ballots. Where are they? They're on the floor over in the corner. They take a tractor, they scoop them up, and they drop the whole thing. But until then, Republicans must compete and we must win. So in conclusion, this is what we must do to restore our country to greatness. The USA is a mess. Our economy is crashing. Inflation is out of control. China, Russia, Iran, North Korea have formed together as a menacing and destructive coalition. Our currency is crashing and will soon no longer be the world standard, which will be the single greatest defeat that we've had in over 200 years. That will be a disaster. And it's happening. But it won't happen with me, not even a chance. Just like Russia would never have invaded Ukraine and China would not be even having a thought about raiding Taiwan. Not even a thought. And we would have left Afghanistan with dignity and strength. I'm the one that got it down to 2,500 people after 21 years. But I would have kept Bagram, the biggest military base, air force in the world, the biggest runways, most powerful runways in the world, 20,000 feet long, eight feet thick, can carry anything. But not because of Afghanistan, but because of China, because that's where China, one hour away is where China makes its nuclear weapons. And you know who's occupying Bagram right now? China. They took it over. We built it, spent billions of dollars many years ago. And that's our greatest embarrassment, in my, in my opinion, the greatest embarrassment in the history of our country, what happened with Afghanistan. Do you know that I spoke to the leader of the Taliban, and I said, uh, Abdul, you're killing our people. You're not going to kill them any longer. Very rough conversation. Call me your excellency. Yes, your excellency, yes. And the press went crazy when they heard I called them. That, I invited them over to the White House. But we, but what he did is he killed three or four people to show that he was leading with strength. So I canceled the meeting. I mean, he actually killed. Remember that? He killed four people just before leaving. I said, cancel the meeting. He wanted to show that he's dealing from strength. This is a whole different deal. These people are. It's a whole different deal. But I said, Abdul, if you do anything, I'm going to hit you harder than any country has ever been hit before. But why, but why do you send me a picture of my home? He asked me. And I said, Abdul, you have to ask other people that question. But you'll be hit harder than any, anybody's ever been hit by our country. From that moment on, we didn't lose one soldier. 18 months, not one soldier in Afghanistan. Not one soldier was hurt or shot at. Nobody was shot at. Nobody was hurt. Then we had a rigged election. I got out. This total incompetent person took over. And they left from the wrong airport. They should have left from Bagram. We have miles and miles of territory around. Three or four. They said they leave from this little thing where the people went crazy but they should have left from Bagram but they should have left with dignity they should have left with strength we were we were so strong the Taliban had a fear of the F-16 those F-16s would come roaring over their heads and they just said get me the hell out of here and now they own those F-16s they took them this person allowed them to take them and I said when we get out we take every screw every bolt we take every little tent, we take all the big tents, we take the army tanks, the planes, we take everything. And I had a couple of guys, like this guy, Millie, what a, what a stupid person he is. Millie, no, he's a stupid. Sir, he said to me, it's cheaper to leave the equipment than it is to take it. I said, let me ask you something, Millie. So we have a $100 million, $150 million airplane. We fill it up with a little tank of gas, we fly it to Pakistan, or we fly it home. 
You think it's cheaper than we do? Yes, sir, I think it's cheaper. So I know where Biden got the idea from these people. They're stupid people. You know, we have great military, like I defeated ISIS. Everyone said you couldn't defeat. I did it very quickly. Very quickly. I did that with great generals, but not the guys you see on television. We defeated ISIS, and we did things that nobody thought were possible. Our military is great, but our leadership at the top, and especially the television guys, are terrible. But we have unbelievable generals. We have some amazing people. Our military is great. But what happened in Afghanistan is the single most embarrassing day in the history of our country, and it's why Putin went into Ukraine. Because he said, these people are weak and they're stupid. They're weak and they're stupid. He would have never gone into Ukraine. If you took the five worst presidents, and I say this all the time, but I think now I'll change it. You could take the 10 worst presidents. They wouldn't have done the damage that look at Joe Biden has done. But the damage he's done to this country, and he's doing bigger damage with his election stuff, because this is big stuff. It never happened. That's a banana republic stuff that's going on. You know, you see this. This crazy, this crazed lunatic in New York, the Attorney General. She's like a crazed lunatic. We found more tapes. I will stop him. I will stop him. I will. Then she said, oh, yes, I could be impartial. Record high deportation. And then that asks, when Trump, if Trump gets in there, how he's going to deal with the situation in Venezuela as well? We already know how Trump was ready to deal with Maduro when he was in power at that time. He put a bounty on his head for a couple million dollars. Check it back in the history you're gonna see, go back in the timeline, you're gonna see Trump versus Maduro. And Trump put a hit or he put a bounty out on his head. So think about Trump sitting in that seat versus Biden sitting in the seat right now because I remember Biden is the one that removed their sanctions the sanctions that was on them that had them humbled now their sanctions are removed there you go they're acting up and they're doing the same foolish things like they always do all over again but think about if Trump was in the position that Biden was in that Biden is in right now I don't even think he would have risked doing something like that given the relations that Guyana has with the US I don't even think Maduro would even think about doing something like that had Trump Donald Trump been sitting in the presidential seat he wouldn't even risk it but the present is what it is and we have to deal with the matter as it presents itself So, as we can see, in a couple of months, elections is coming up. Hopefully, Republicans see a victory. Hopefully, Donald Trump is the presidential candidate. Because at that time, we can guarantee that there will be some change in the way that this situation is presently being handled and I kind of can see at that point things going in a direction that Maduro does not want it to go people are watching everybody's observing what's going on there's a whole lot of persons from Guyana that live in the US right now and they're making noise so attention is being paid to this so let's see how this is going to progress what do you guys think do you guys think if trump was in there it would be different as to what's going on right now or do you think it would be the same type of situation or do you think it would be better if trump was in there for maduro let's have a conversation in the comment section about this and let's now hear what Maduro has planned for January 25th. He said he has a plan that's going to lead up to January 25th. That's going to help him to have complete control of Esequibo. Now, we're hearing that GDF 
helicopter crash. After the turn, today is the seventh GDF helicopter crash close to the border. Five army members are dead, among others. Maduro say he got a plan to completely dominate that region there by January 25th. Did we hear what he got saying his own words? And let's have a conversation in the comment section about it now. Let's get into it right now. Fully unveiled on Friday, the new map of the nation that includes the Guayana Sequiba as its 24th state. During the session, the president of the National Assembly, Jorge Rodriguez, emphasized that it is a map that represents the justice and accuracy, the historical reality of the country since the times of the liberator Simon Bolivar. He also emphasized the participation of the Venezuelan people in the defense of national sovereignty. The action is part of nine measures announced by the head of state, Nicolas Maduro, after the victory of the consultative referendum of December 3rd. President Nicolas Maduro Moros led the march for loyalty day as the people demonstrated in support of the government's plan of action on the Esequibo. This Friday, on the day of loyalty and love in the country, citizens marched from fine arts to the palace of Miraflores. Demonstrators are shown with the flag of Venezuela, banners in defense of the Esequibo, and the new map of the nation implemented in schools. The government of Venezuela seeks to incorporate the organic law to create the state of Guayana Esequiba and the election of authorities in the region. President Maduro and Executive Vice President participated in the event. During his speech, the Venezuelan head of state took the opportunity to demand once again the coercive measures against the Venezuelan people be lifted. Wow! So the map is slated, the plot is thickening, and they are ready and focused on the things that they want to see executed. Look, they already got a plan for the place that we call Guyana. What do you guys think? Do you guys think that this will actually happen? Do you guys think that Maduro will actually see? The day when he or some part of his party or some part of his political affiliates will dominate and run the region that we know as Esequibo and take that big chunk out of Guyana? Will we see the day when this will actually be a factual thing? I don't think so. I don't think that it will come within our generation. That's my perspective. What do you guys think? Let's have a conversation about this in the comment section because it's very important for us to have conversations about this. Why? Because it's a pressing topic and it's something that if we don't take seriously and consider, it seems like all the steps are pretty much going to just go into implementation the way that Maduro and the AKA Venezuelans have in mind.